Hi, this is my second edition of Spike's Backyard Video Blog, and today I'd like to talk to you about two old friends of mine, Rhoda and Betty. Now, I first met Rhoda when I was working way back when in the nursing home in the Alzheimer's unit, and she was a visiting nurse, that is, she was inspecting the place to see that we were up to state standards, that is, a visiting nurse inspector. And I was taking care of the residents, you know, going around my guitar, guitar, bing, ding, ding, and, you know, making people, uh, in, engaging with people, talking with people, visiting with people. And I'm singing a jolly little song, and I dance into the charting office, and there's this very, very, very stern woman, looking woman with a silver hair drawn back into a bun, and just looking o at me over granny glasses. And oh, no, no, that's quite all right. Continue what you were doing. And you know, I, I did never, I did not see her for a very long time after that. But um, I saw that she'd been so kind as to leave a note in uh, uh, to my manager saying, "Very, very cheerful." And oh, what did she use? Perky <laughs> activity staff. So now, of course, in the meantime, then I meet my other friend Betty, who. She's just come in, and she's a wild woman. She's not really, she's actually a little better than, um, not better, per, you know, in better mental shape than a lot of our residents. That is, she's still able to remember that, you know, she's living in, uh, uh, you know, a long-term health care facility, she remembers who people are, and things like that. So she was rather high-functioning. And, oh, what a hellion she was! Oh, my goodness! She had such a feisty personality. I mean, this woman was rough! Just a really spicy, gingery woman, the type of gingery lady that's just a pleasure to meet. Absolute pleasure. And just always had the most wonderful little story about how once she went boating on Boston Bay with a boy. <gasps> no, back when she was a teenager, back in, <laughs> well, her days. And how her father was so upset because she they'd sailed off into a fog and who knows what would have happened. <laughs> and all sorts of wonderful tales like that. By the way, in the background, you might hear uh, Doctor Who and Jack. That is actually Jack barking right now. Shut up, Mommy's talking, dear. <sighs> um, I'll, in I'll introduce them at a later point in time. But in any case, Betty was a very wonderful, feisty gal. And then Betty gets settled in and... Rhoda turns up again, this time not as a visiting nurse inspector, but as a resident. And it seems that she thought so highly of our residential care community that she had actually made plans once she got the diagnosis to go there once things were too tough. And when people move into a long-term health care facility, they do so in times of crisis. The kids aren't going to move mom into the nursing home when she's all right. They're going to move her in the nursing home when she's turning on the oven or in danger of walking out in the woods and dying. So, it was a very rough night for both her and the nursing staff her first night. She was very, very convinced that there was something wrong because she didn't remember making those arrangements. But for some reason, I was able to talk her and get her a cup of tea and say, look, you know you've inspected this place before. She says, well, I don't particularly remember it, but I have inspected all the places in the States. Oh, well, you actually gave us five deficiency-free years running, and that's a pretty high thing to do. I mean, deficiencies can be, you missed one guy's night, me night cold medication once. I mean, or this windowsill wasn't exactly straight to standards. You know, I mean, it's hard to get five deficiency free. I mean, we were the best of the best. And she said, five? And I said, and to God. She said, okay, I guess I can stay here the night. And she calmed down. And as folks do when they get into a balanced and stable setting, 
she was able to keep her head above her dementia for a very, very, very long time and actually remembered once she calmed down that she was there. And I mean, for a couple of years, it was like we could have given her a key to the place and she could have because she was a nurse. I mean, <laughs> let's face it. I mean, she would calm down resident, other residents in crisis and she and Betty both being very <laughs> formidable women immediately became good friends and I gravitated to them too. We were we started jokingly calling ourselves the Three Musketeers and there was even the joke for a while that in our next life we would be triplets and God help our mother. <laughs> of course, you know, the one the one really bad thing about long-term health care is that you just watch people die and you watch people getting sicker and sicker and dying but there were some pretty good days we would I mean I remember one time we were at some concert we'd bust them all a concert I lost this necklace I found it again but I mean at the time I thought it was lost and good old Rhoda she just put an arm around me she patted me on the knees it's okay dear it's okay it's only a thing she was right and beautiful and Betty just Oh my God, what a, she was always so much fun. They, the two of them together, just telling their stories and Rhoda would tell me some wonderful stories. Um, you know, once about uh, her, she, how she had this old pet cow named Daisy who she could lean against because she didn't breathe so well as a child. And when she would bring the cattle in from the pasture, this one cow would allow her to put her arm around him walk with her beautiful or the time that she or her her sisters one of her sister's boyfriends grew up to be the same surgeon that she worked with in the emergency room and he when the, she was a kid would bring her a chocolate bar to bribe her to get rid of her so he could be with her sister and the funny thing is when they were in the ER she said that he would sometimes give her a candy, bring her a candy bar, and, you know, fun. Um, she also told me about the time that the Hells Angels came to town, and somebody, during the night, thought it'd be a fun idea to drive their motorcycles over where people were sleeping in their sleeping bags. So needless to say, there were people coming into the ER. And she says that they were very polite, and they were all, and she just basically said, move that gurney there. Yes, ma'am. And she says they were polite, but I mean... This woman, oh, picture the most stern, oh God, um, if you know, if you remember Ms. McGonagall from Harry Potter, or, I mean, if it were her life story, yeah, it would be, I'm blanking on the actress's name, no worries, but any case, this woman, very stern, but very good, very fair, stern, but fair, but I can imagine all she had to do was shoot him a look. And they would do anything she wanted. <laughs> and, oh, spicy Betty who would tell us always the tales about how she would date all the men. And, and her father was one of the first guys to drive an automobile across the country. He was one of the first guys to own an automobile here in Vermont. Um, wow, I mean, and she would tell me, Betty would tell me about how... I mean, here I am recording this on a computer that's going to then shoot it all over the, all over the world. Um, when she was born, there wasn't even a refrigerator. They had something called an ice box, where they would get the ice from Lake Champlain, and it would be kept in a big ice house and sawdust underground to keep it from melting. And the guy would come with a leather apron and chop off little be bits of ice and the kids would run after him begging for a bit of ice in the, in, in, in the street. You know, hot summer day. <laughs> Cheap popsicle. <laughs> but she'd say that then they'd put the block of ice in the refrigerator and there was a or an ice box and there was a pan underneath to catch the drippings and it was her job to get the pan with the drippings once it was full and she said, you know, we'll slosh ice water on the ankles. <laughs> oh, Betty. So, Betty and Rhoda, we had some great times together. We, you know, we'd go out on the porch and talk and they were just such wonderful social women, them and, well, the whole crowd. I mean, all of them. And yet, it 
all things do have to go, and <sighs> one and I was not able to deal with the constant state of loss and grief, and started spending less and less time there, and not being able to work as much there without being torn apart. But that's a whole other story. One day, on one of my days off, they called me and told me that Betty had died, and I couldn't believe. I mean, I'd lost everybody, but this one, Betty, she. It was like the one you'd least expect to die. She was so vibrant, so full of life. She was 90 freaking too. Um, and yet so beautiful and full of life. What had happened was she'd come to breakfast, and it was her favorite breakfast. It was pancakes and bacon with maple syrup, and she'd even got the bitch about the maple syrup not being New York maple syrup, which was... She loved to bitch. I mean, that's an activity in itself for, you know, hey, you're on the high side of nine decades on this earth. Bitch about anything you like. You deserve it. And she enjoyed her breakfast, had a playful conversation with everybody in the dining room, got up from her chair and sat down again and was dead. Just like that, gone. No loss of facility, no nothing. Now, at this place, for years and years and years and years, when somebody dies after the after the medical examiner takes them away, um, takes the body away in the coroner's van, the place would put a white rose on their pillow so that when the residents, I mean, when the residents' families came in to gather their stuff and, you know, pack up, there would be this white rose. Very nice gesture. And, well, it was the sort of thing that begged a song. And I remember that it was way before even I met Betty or Rhoda that I wrote the song, but that was one of the first times that I sang it that I wasn't able to stop crying afterwards as I sang it as the... Because by then, some of the staff were like, play the song, play the song, play the song. So, you know, play the song. When somebody's dying, it became sort of a thing in itself for the staff. Oh, the staff. What angels. What angels. To this day, they're still there, making sure people are kept with their dignity intact, kept able to be themselves. And even, I mean, Betty was one of the lucky ones. She died with all her facilities intact, and that's very rare. Most of them execute a slow crawl towards death where they lose one ability after another. First, it's the ability to write checks or run your own business. Then it's the ability to remember th things that you learned as an adult. And then it's remembering how to act appropriately. Then it's how to remembering how to dress. Then it's remembering how to feed yourself. Then you lose your ability to be continent. The last thing to go is the ability to keep the head up. It pretty much mirrors the development of a baby, only backwards. And it's a slow crawl for a lot of people. Um, and Rhoda started that slow crawl. Now, Rhoda had told me so many stories of her mother, and I knew that she was starting to get ill when she started getting nervous. And was, where's my mother? Because Rhoda had told me about all the stories about her mother, including the one about when her mother died, that her mother had a wonderful death. Just they were having a cup, they were watching something on TV, and she said, Go get me a cup of tea, would you? And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Came back, and mom was gone. Well, not bad, you know, sitting watching TV. Um, but Rhoda kept getting slower and slower and unable to remember that her mother died. And of course, I couldn't. You can't say, your mom's dead, you should know so. No, you've got to say, well, tell me about your mother. So instead of that, I told her all the stories that she told me of her mother. There were so many of them. And I was able to, sometimes she would say, my mom's dead, isn't she? I said, well, yes, but that's okay. She's still with you. And she said, yeah, I know. Thank you. But after that, she couldn't remember, but she still remembered me, and she knew that I was the one staff member she could trust. I don't know why, except that we were so very alike. 
I was not there when she died. I, she went very slowly, eventually became bedbound, eventually stopped talking, and just drifted away one day in September. Several years ago now, but it's still, I still miss them both very, very, very much. And all of them, all the people that I've lost, all the people that I knew, they're not lost. They're right here. If I ever choose to get a tattoo, it's going to be a white rose on either one of the shoulders. I haven't decided which. And it's going to be a line from the song that I wrote called White Rose. Though I merely, <laughs> Though I barely met you. I never shall forget you. <clears throat> There's a white rose <clears throat> on your pillow. Its petals fall softly where you laid your head to sleep There's a white rose on your pillow You've left me your memories to keep We share these days together With the memories we treasure you tell me your tales of your golden way back when I won't give in to sorrow when parting comes tomorrow I'll remember that we will meet again There's a white rose on your pillow its petals fall softly where you laid your head to sleep. There's a white rose on your pillow. You've left me your memories to keep. Time it passes swiftly like a river down a valley. And paces slip by like the ships are to sea. Though I barely met you, I never shall forget you. Rest easy, be well, and go in peace. There's a white rose on your pillow. Its petals fall softly where you laid your head to sleep. There's a white rose on your pillow. You've left me your memories to keep. You've left me your memories. Okay, guys, that's it for my second video blog. I'll hope to see you soon. Peace out. Leave comments below. Like, subscribe. Whatever, man.